Good afternoon, everyone. Kerasoft Technology would like to welcome you to our AWS webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Michael Cotton, Principal Solutions Architect Security, U.S. Federal Amazon Web Services. Jeff Szymanski, Wicker Partner Specialist, AWS. And Paul Winslow, our Partner Ecosystem Go-To Market Manager from Presidio Federal. Michael, the floor is all yours. Great, thanks. So, good afternoon, folks. My name is Mike Cotton. Um, I'm a principal security specialist at AWS, and I'm here to talk to you about the Cybersecurity Executive Order 14028. A lot of this presentation is going to be kind of a recap of what it, what we believe it means, what the industry believes it means, and what it means through conversation with various different government entities. So, to start off, um, it's, it's about removing threat intelligence barriers, not just between the government and its partners and its providers, but just in, as an in industry in general, right? It contains specific agency requirements like adoption of zero trust principles, new requirements for ISVs and CSPs, and a lot of the guidance around defining critical software, maturing your logging environment, uh, endpoint detection and response, cybersecurity uh, uh, incident replay, uh, response playbooks, uh, FAR language for things that are now in the cybersecurity executive order and ISV software development requirements. So starting off, uh, the agencies had a 60, 75, 90, and 100 day or 180 day go-to plan, right? Uh, some of these things can be considered compulsory and pro forma, uh, but they started off with update and prioritize plans to adopt cloud technology developed plans to implement zero trust architectures in accordance with NIST guidance. It's important to know that 800-207 is out there today. Um, that guidance is readily available uh, for uh, FCEB agencies to, to adopt zero trust. And we are actively working, um, AWS is actively working with NIST and GSA to develop that guidance around cloud architecture and uh, references, right? Um, there's a kind of a nod on this next one here to the CDM program, originally born out of NPVD, now, now rebranded CISA. Uh, CDM was about continuous diagnostic and mitigation, and it was about telemetry data and reporting the, the status of an environment, right? Are you, are you uh, vulnerable to any known vulnerabilities through CVEs? Are your systems patched? Do you have an accurate assessment of what systems are in your environment? This twist here really is providing the object level data to CISA. It's a correlation with some of those things that are happening with cloud as well. This is actually providing the telemetry data in its raw format to CISA so they can actively do threat hunting and, and, and intelligence uh, gathering on uh, federal government agencies infrastructure. They also wanted you in 90 days to identify types and sensitivity of data stored within the agency and report that to CISA. Prioritize the most sensitive data and identify appropriate processing and storage methods for that sensitive data. And then starting 180 days, they wanted you to report every 60 days on, on the adoption of multi-factor authentication, uh, adoption of encryption at rest and in transit. One of the things I wanna point out here is PIV and CAC card authentication, HSPD 12 and the CAC requirements in the DOD world are still the gold standard, right? Those are still the things that they're moving towards and continue to move towards. There may be some new things coming in the future, what this EO does is it expands the opportunity to use other MFA capabilities or technologies like YubiKey and things like that that are they're going through the certification process. So when we say adopt multi-factor authentication, it really isn't just the PIV and CAT card adoption. It is really expanding the scope, although there needs to be a certification program around that, that specific technology that you're going to be using, but it, great, it, it provides greater capability um, for your, your assets, your infrastructure, when you're, when you're dealing with constituents or internal users. So some of the things that are, are, are really pro forma or compulsory for agencies, this is just a reinforcement of those, right? Implement guidance for least user privilege, which all agencies should be exercising today. It really is a core tenet of zero trust. Network, network segmentation, or commonly referred to as micro segmentation, is another core tenet of zero trust. And then the proper configuration of uh, critical software. And that's really a nod to the supply chain vulnerabilities that happened under the solar winds event. And we could talk about that um, offline through questions and answers, or you can reach out to me directly and I can give you my perspective on that. And then really, you know, much like organizations today, they adopt disaster recovery playbooks and they game day them. 
know, they tabletop them those exercises. This is really pushing the, the uh, forward the approach that we need to do the same thing with cybersecurity incident playbooks, right? And then agencies should be adopting endpoint detection and response. And this is just kind of a push towards that. There's more on that coming a little bit later. Um, system must be capable of cyber hunt detection and response. This is that object level data that we spoke about uh, in a previous slide. This is really giving CISA the ability to, to look out across the federal civilian and executive branch agencies and to get a, you know, a snapshot in time and be able to go back and do forensic analysis and see where the vulnerabilities were, how far and wide the impact was. And then really M2131, the OMB mandate around logging maturity, moving from the EL1 to EL3 maturity uh, phase, giving you two years to do that. And then along with providing CISA this object level data, you should be providing the centralized access and visibility to the highest SOC for each uh, agency. And then when we talk about end, endpoint detection, really we're, we're starting to say that, you know, you should be doing this. And if you're doing this, let's give CISA access to this. And so they can help you identify future state improvements. And then the rest of these really fall on CISA, right? Uh, a process for continuous performance monitoring, that is access to the object level data and to be able to do their threat hunting, their forensic analysis on, on an incident if it did happen. And then report back to, to OMB, uh, efforts to accelerate government-wide EDR, uh, uh, EDR efforts. Um, out of that, we're gonna, they're going to develop technical reference architectures and maturity models for agencies to consume. And again, I point you back to OMB M2131, the logging maturity. We're trying to do very, something very similar with that to say, this is how you meet the logging maturity requirement. Well, this is how you meet the EDR requirement in the federal government. Okay, I'm going to answer, I'm going to, this just popped up on my screen question. I'm going to answer that after the fact. Okay. It's a, Mike, that's one of our polling questions. You can go ahead and ignore it. Okay. That's just kind of threw me for a loop here. Um, and then within 180 days, CISA shall develop a playbook, you know, best practices for EDR solution deployments, right? The real goal here is government-wide operational visibility, right? Visibility is, is very key. Right, so, so some of the new things that came out of the EO were ISV software deployment or development, excuse me. And this is still a very new developing standard. We are past 180 day mark and there is a 800-161, uh, which is, um, I, think, I think it's either in draft or it's in its final stages before it publishes as a final document but it's not the final standard, right? The final standard is gonna, is, is should, I think the last time I checked, it was in March coming this year, but really what it's gonna encompass is secure build environments, right? And this, this is the notion that if you have a true production environment and a true dev environment, they shouldn't mix, right? We should be able to create that micro segmentation, that network segmentation between a dev environment, and there should be no dependencies on enterprise systems in that dev environment but you should use very similar methods uh, of policy enforcement, things like risk-based authentication and conditional access, right? Encryption in, in flight and at rest, lots and lots of logging. For those who are very familiar with what happened with SolarWinds, logging is very critical here. That's how they go back and they do a forensic analysis and see what happened and how, how that manifested itself as a vulnerability in that product. And then we move to managing software supply chain. And you know, automated checks for dependency vulnerabilities. But really, what we're doing here is we're 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 seeing the federal government move towards saying, yes, we get your software is good software, but we need attestation for that. If you if you just remember recently with the log four J um, incident where you had vulnerabilities in 14, 15, 16, 17 versions, or the dot versions. Um, we at AWS, we have a very good method of uh, you know, software building materials. And we also have a method of when we share you know, sample code and sample assets with our, with our customers, we're able to track what are all the components of that software? What are all the packages, the bindles, the code that the versions are running on? And when that log4j incident <clears throat> happened, we were able to, to proactively go back to our customers in a very short order, it was in less than 24 hours and say, 
over the course of the past X number of months, this product, these, these sample assets were shared with you and they're vulnerable to the log4j vulnerability. Here's the steps to go remediate that. And this is exactly what the federal government's trying to do. They're trying to be able to say, let's go back. And if you, got, if you understand supply chain uh, vulnerabilities, this is, this is the same concept. Software bill of materials is, is actually able to tell you to, when you could go back and look at not the all up vulnerability of a package, like a solar winds package, but the actual components that that package were built from. And then when they put this all in place, there's gonna be a compliance program that does the attestation for conformance with these requirements, right? And we've talked about the critical software and I gave you the example around the SolarWinds incident. So this is, this is just another emphasis on critical software development and critical software deployment in your environment. Uh, micro segmentation, least user privilege, lots of telemetry data, lots of visibility. So in summary, the executive order addresses threat intelligence sharing. A lot of that stuff is going on today, but they're trying to make it more ubiquitous. It's, it's not just the federal government that's vulnerable. You probably can look back and think about Sony being hacked a few years ago and a number of different incidents around you know, the, the IT industry. And what we wanna do, what the government wants to do is they want to be able to gather that knowledge and be able to proactively just like they do with antivirus, look for those patterns, those signatures and preempt them before they happen. And it also gives you know, the ability to react much quicker to zero day vulnerabilities as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, the, so if you wanna stay up to date on all the follow on guidance to the EO, there's two locations that you can do that. And, and that's NIST and GSA. And I'm highlighting a few things here that um, I've been tracking since last May and that's OMB 2131. Just kind of want to point out here that AWS partner Splunk has published their guidance already. They published in October and their guidance is complete, either a SaaS offering or build it your own offering. They have guidance to help you meet M2131. And then again, the zero trust NIST reference architecture um, has been out for a while, uh, 800 207. This is just a push. There's a recent, a recent OMB memo that came out just a couple of weeks ago, uh, pushing the, you know, the federal civilian executive branch agencies to adopting zero trust principles. And it's pretty interesting when you look at it, right? They're using terms like, treat your application as if it's on the internet. Do not trust your network any longer. Policy enforcement points at every step. Things like authentication at the load balancers, things like authentication that passes through and, and functions with conditional access on the application itself. Standard stuff like three-tier web architectures where the web can talk to the app and the app can talk to the data, but the web can't jump and talk to the data. Micro segmentation, so no more east and west traffic, north and south only. And we do this by referencing objects, not just providing CIDR block ranges of IP addresses that can speak to each other, right? <laughs> also M2107, which is uh, IPv6 adoption. Uh, that's a three-year uh, play, and we're heavily involved in that. Uh, cybersecurity incident response, is a, there's a playbook out by NIST today. Uh, critical software has been defined. Uh, there's a developer verification software standard out of NIST. Uh, OMB 2101, which is further guidance on you know, EDR. Um, the FAR regulations or the FAR language is still a work in progress. And one of the things I wanted to bring up today, too, was... CISA published guidance just recently um, on IPv6 with TIG 3.0. So there's a common thread here, right? IPv6 in general, IPv6 in TIC. TIC is Trusted Internet Connection 3.0 is the latest version. It's, um, it's a descriptive process, not a, excuse me, a prescriptive process. Excuse me, I said it wrong again. It's a descriptive process, not a prescriptive process. And the risk determination is made by the agency authority in this probably case, the CISA or the, C, uh, the CIO. And what it's doing, it's allowing you, you to adopt um, technology, cloud technology, and technology that meets the requirements, not necessarily the way TIC 2.0 was, where it was very prescriptive and you could only use certain technologies and capabilities, and they had to be configured a certain way to, to meet the OMB standard for, uh, for a TIC 2.0 implementation. But the thing that's really interesting for me is that you cannot implement TIC 3.0 
without bumping up against zero trust principles. And you cannot implement zero trust principles without bumping up against TIC 3.0 principles. I'm, we, let me just jump to the next slide here. Um, I'm gonna kind of go to the middle of it real quick. Um, we're working with many uh, FCEB agencies on TIC 3.0 pilots. And invariably when we start talking with them uh, and we start you know, giving them the, the, the SIS of principles around TIC 3.0, they say that sounds very similar to zero trust. And the truth is, it is. It's very similar, right? You trust nothing, you validate everything, you do conditional access, you log everything. It's very zero trust principles, right? So it's just an interesting correlation I thought I would bring up. So I just wanted to po point out that when the executive order came out, we got to work and we published a series of four blogs. They're listed here on these bullets. Uh, these links are active and live today. You can go look at them. We're actually working on um, secure software development on AWS guidance. We're just waiting for the final guidance out of NIST and GSA before we publish it. We recently launched a new service called, called, called CloudTrail Lake. Now, I don't want to make this an AWS one-on-one, but CloudTrail is our, um, our control plane, our API, uh, logging service. So anything that happens in, in AWS, whether it's done by you or done by AWS, it's logged in CloudTrails. It's, it, it's, it's immutable um, and it lives for as long as you want it to live. By default, it lives for a year, but you can, you can keep it for as long as you want. We recently added a new service to CloudTrail called CloudTrail Lake, which gives you the ability to start building a security event and incident management uh, service on top of CloudTrail Lake. And we also have other services as well, like OpenShift, excuse me, OpenSearch and um, an Elk stack running on um, Elasticsearch. So you can build those. And then we have partners, right? I, I mentioned Splunk has already uh, put out their M2131 guidance and I'm actively working with Sumo Logic and New Relic to get that gu the, their guidance out as well. And we have a working group with NIST. Uh, all the CSPs are working with NIST on uh, the zero trust reference architectures as it relates to cloud. Um, our public policy folks and compliance folks are working with NIST on the modernization of FISMA, you know, 800-53. I kind of left off the rev version because right now we're at rev five and it will probably be rev six when they, they move through it. We're aggressively working with NIST and GSA uh, for IPv6 adoption um, in the cloud, that's a that's a very aggressive, uh, good good aggressive goal that the federal government's uh, undertaken. I've worked with some of the CIO leads and CISO leads around the, the federal space on that. We have a published cybersecurity incident response guide. It's a it because it, because that is that is what we do at AWS. It's not. Uh, developed and released as a result of the EO. It's been around for some time, but it's very relevant. We recently pub published a ransomware management on AWS using the NIST CSF framework. So that's, you know, that's, that's re very relevant to uh, cybersecurity and the EO as well. And again, I mentioned the fact that we're doing uh, TIC 3.0 pilots around uh, FCEB, and we're working very closely with CISA on those, and we've been working very closely with CISA since I've been at AWS since 2015. There's also this notion of a cloud log aggregation warehouse, whereas if, you, if the agency uh, opts into it, it'll give CISA access to all your cloud logs. So this is the object level access that they're asking for. The unfortunate thing, it's easy to do in the cloud. It can be more difficult to do when you're in an on-prem or hybrid world, but we're trying to attack it from all the different angles. And I also mentioned that we're working on a secure software development at AWS guy. We're just waiting. Um, we as, a, as AWS do great endpoint detection and response on EC2 instances and the platform, but when you start moving out towards, you know, mobile devices and, and, and uh, laptops and stuff like that, we, we fill that void with our partners. And again, our public policy folks and compliance folks are working on the, the FAR language. And again, I, I, we, we, when all these things come out, like M2131, um, they're working on the, the new modern, the modernization of 800-53, the IPv6 with TIC 3.0. We typically get, we're part of an industry consortium. We get pre-read on that where the industry can actually um, influence how that guidance comes out. So we're actively involved in doing that. Um, and we've been doing that for years, but I know that the, the most recently the uptick has been pretty significant. And then the last thing I wanted to mention 
uh, just, I think it was a week ago, um, National Security Memorandum, NSM 8 came out and I read it uh, because this is part of my job. And I grabbed this excerpt from here and it, because it, because when I was reading it, I said to myself, well, this sounds like 14028. This is not me typing. This is an actual excerpt from the memorandum. And it's, it's very consistent with 14028. So what does that mean? That means that not everything, not 100% of M2131, not 100% of NIST you know, 207 or 161 are going to translate in the uh, National Security Department of Defense and Intelligence Community Systems, but a lot of that work will. I would probably venture to guess um, accounting for differences in, in uh, like JWCC and stuff like that. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, overlap considerably and make the, the level of effort uh, for DISA and the defense agencies and the intelligence agencies to adopt uh, the patterns that uh, are being put forth in NSM 88. So with that, I'm finished. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll answer them on uh, on Slack or or if there's a way to get them to me email, I'll, I'll gladly answer them there too. So thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Mike. That was really uh, informative and actually, uh, I think, sets up very nicely the things that I want to talk about. So give me a second here and I will put my presentation up and um, we should be good to go. Okay, can you all see my presentation? Yep, we can see it. Great, thank you. So, you put it in slideshow mode. Okay, it's showing slideshow mode for me. Is it, it might be just a hair delayed. Is it showing a slideshow mode now? Um, we're seeing your full PowerPoint. Hmm. It's fine how it is though, you're good. Okay. So I'm Jeff Szymanski. So uh, I am uh, new to the AWS team as of June when Wicker was acquired. So for those of you that don't know anything about Wicker, Wicker is a secure collaboration platform. And we, are the, we were acquired by AWS, as I mentioned, in June. And so we're now part of the uh, security product suite uh, inside of the AWS family. So, you know, Mike's presentation really, I, I think, teed up very nicely the couple of things that I want to highlight in my portion. Uh, and what I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about today is a couple of the sections that, that Mike talked about that are part of the EO that really, you know, sort of fit nicely into the problems and, and, and customer use cases that Wicker is trying to solve for. So um, there's lots of information that Mike just shared and, and there's certainly applicability to much of it in, in what Wicker does. But I, I think there's a couple of key sections that I want to highlight that, that will really sort of resonate and, and reinforce some of the points that, that Mike brought up. So sharing information, you know, whether it's incident response or, or just in general has become a challenge. You know, there's lots of different ways to share information. There's lots of disparate tool sets out, of, out there. And there's a lot of lots of different standards that exist, but specifically when there are um, threats or incidents that you're trying to respond to, you know we may need to be able to create uh, practices that allow us to share that information very quickly, very safely, very securely, and and it, we can spin it up or spin it down in a very responsive manner to ensure that the right people and the right agencies. Uh, and, and even in public sector, I'm sorry, in private sector, are able to get access to the information they need to get in a timely fashion so we can respond quicker and, and, and solve the problems that we're trying to deal with, you know, real time without, you know, spending time trying to figure out how are we going to get the information to the right parties. Uh, you know, we can, we can create use tool sets so that the information can be set up and prepared for ahead of time so that it, when it needs to be shared, we have a platform that's ready to go. So uh, we've certainly seen that, and Mike highlighted a few examples that have come up here recently, but having a mechanism to be able to get that information out there and to do it in a manner that all parties are, are confident that it's happening uh, 
quickly and securely is is critical to our to our success. You know, Mike talked a little bit about modernization and, and the things that the the government and and frankly private sector as well needs to do to up, update their systems and their policies and their practices. So there's sort of two two sides to this. Uh, one is you know, just having the uh, MFA and encryption standards for your uh, communication and data transfer practices. So as, as Mike highlighted, there's lots of different ways that agencies do that today, some better than others. There's, there's tools out there to assist with that, but you know, you need to make sure that you have a practice and policy so that you can ensure that the users are always, you know, following those guidelines and, and adhering to whatever standards are in place. And then CISA, you know, as, as was pointed out, is now putting some framework together so that there can be some consistency across the board, which will then allow uh, agencies to share information in sort of a standardized manner so that, you know, we're sure that, you know, whatever's happening is happening uh, sort of the same way across the board so that we can, again, get back to that principle of being able to respond quickly, being able to uh, react to the situation and make sure that we get the right data into the right people's hands uh, uh, in a manner that uh, ensures that only the people that need to see it are going to be seeing it. And really encryption has been at the core of what Wicker has done since our, since our founding back in uh, 2012. And then the final thing, and again, Mike touched on some of this and, and different companies have I've already started this process to enhance upon that is putting that playbook together. So, you know, what is going to be the policy and principles? Um, what are you, you know, what what practices are you going to implement? What standards need to be in place? So out of band communications is one of the key things that gets highlighted in this concept. And, you know, again, that's a place where, you know, having the ability or having the capability to uh, respond uh, independent of what the communication platform is or what the connectivity platform in is um, is critically important. And again, uh, Wicker has some uh, functionality that will allow customers and users to to be able to do that. And again, if we can you know map that into the standards and into the playbook, uh, then it just becomes consistent across the board. Jeff, I did want to let you know that your slides are not moving. Hmm. Shoot, they are moving from me, so I'm sure it is user error. So, uh, so do you see a slide that now shows Wicker and the kind of the functionality of Wicker? Yes, thank you. Cool. Um, well, our marketing folks are going to be disappointed because we spent literally thousands of hours putting these slides together. So we want to, you know, it. I'm, I'm sad on their behalf that you weren't able to witness that, but you will get to see them when we uh, share the deck after the uh, after the webinar is over. So, um, so here's just a little bit more about Wicker and, and kind of how it ties back into the theme for those of you that hadn't heard of us. Uh, either pre or post uh, the acquisition. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the uh, um, collaboration space. So, uh, you know, we provide the opportunity to do voice, video, file transfer, text, all the traditional communication methods. And we give you that ability on multi-device, multi-operating system, multi-connectivity um, platforms. So iOS, Windows, Mac OS, Android, you know, everything in between, and we can do it on 5G, LTE, Wi-Fi, wired, or, or any of the common, uh, and even, out of, you know, uh, low bandwidth environments. Our, our principle is really around, or our, 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 our hallmark, I should say, is really around end-to-end -end encryption. So, you know, the simplest way to say that is any packet of information uh, that goes across the Wicker platform is encrypted end to end. So whether it's a voice conversation, a text message, you know, a file that gets transferred, all of that is encrypted. So, you know, again, back to some of the themes that we talked about in the EO, you know, the, the platform itself gives you the ability to address some of the encryption concerns that the EO mandates. Um, and then we also, these last two points uh, drive into some of the other elements of the uh, requirements and that we give you full administrative control and we give you the ability to do compliance logging. So, you know, the, the simplest way to sort of summarize this slide is we give you, you know, all the feature function benefits that, that 
the customers and users are used to working with on a collaboration application. And we give you that with the security and compliance and administration capabilities that uh, agency and, and, and uh, customers require. So CISOs, CIOs, CTOs are looking to make sure they have the ability to manage and, and um, uh, you know, govern their environment, but also make sure that their user functionality does not uh, does not suffer in the process. And you know, we like to call that a little bit of the best of both worlds concept, where you're getting the functionality and the uh, uh, compliance side of the equation. So again, as uh, Mike highlighted, myself and, and the Wicker team is available if you want to do a deeper dive on any of these topics. Uh, if there's additional follow up questions, you know, this is sort of the, you know, uh, short version of, of the capabilities because we really wanted to focus on how those capabilities sort of tie into the things that are highlighted in the executive order. And uh, hopefully uh, you have a little bit better feel for that uh, hearing me talk for a few minutes. So this is how you get a hold of us, uh, wicker.com or uh, LinkedIn uh, Wicker. And, uh, you know, again, myself and the Wicker team are available and at your disposal should, uh, should you have further questions or you want to uh, dive into it a little bit deeper. So with that, my portion of the presentation is going to end. I am going to introduce my colleague at Presidio, Paul Winslow. Paul Winslow and I have been working together for longer than probably either one of us would care to acknowledge. And uh, Presidio is one of the great partners that the AWS team works with uh, uh, in the industry. So Paul, I'll kick it over to you, sir. Well, thanks very much. And I uh, hope everybody's having a pleasant afternoon. Uh, we certainly wanna thank you all for tiling into the subject matter, you know, the three, key, three keys to fulfill new cybersecurity mandates uh, are critically important to uh, agencies in general, but specifically to the people that are dialing in today. Uh, so on behalf of Presidio Government Solutions, I'd like to thank you all for your time, as well as to the extended Kerasoft team, Amazon Web Services, uh, Michael Cotton, and uh, AWS Wicker, Jeff Samaski, for uh, providing uh, this information. Uh, of course, Presidio Government Solutions is a sponsor of today's uh, meeting. But before I tell you about our firm, uh, which is the next couple of slides, I'd like to tell you a short story about VARs and value-added integrators that I've experienced. Uh, in my 30 years in the industry, and I've been around that long, uh, I've held public sector channel-facing roles with uh, world-class technology providers, including Dell, IBM, EMC, and Apple, to name a few. And I've worked with countless business partners, lots of them. Uh, from, with this perspective and this background, I can sincerely endorse Presidio, both commercial and federal, as one of the finest partners that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And I don't say that just because I work there. Uh, you know, so Presidio you know, partners with and advises government customers as they navigate all of the IT modernization mandates, such as what we talked about, uh, by recommending the right technologies. We support customers through their entire IT modernization journey, wherever they are in the process. Uh, we also work with customers to navigate decision-making in internally, since these journeys can be long and requirements are ever-changing. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, we can continue to work with you, whether you work with us directly uh, as a large business, which we are in federal, or through teaming partnerships, which we're glad to introduce that meet the, uh, that meet the agency objectives. Okay. And finally, uh, you know, we understand uh, Amazon Web Services, of course, and the Wicker solutions that we've heard about today, and all these issues and, so and solutions that they address. Okay. Well, very good. So now I'm going to go into the meat of my, uh, my handful of slides. And uh, for those of you who have not worked with Presidio so far, Presidio Network Solutions is a global organization dedicated uh, to a solutions-oriented consultative approach. Uh, Presidio Networking, or TNS as we call it internally, is a massive organization uh, with uh, $6.4 billion in, avenue, at, in annual revenue uh, of 4,900 plus employees and 60 plus offices worldwide. Big company. Uh, since we've been supporting the federal government 
mission since day one, uh, we uh, we uh, ran into a little road bump about 18 months ago when the when the the company, which was a U.S. based publicly traded company, was acquired by a foreign equity firm. Uh, so at that point, uh, we made the decision to continue working with uh, the federal government. So we spun off uh, our federal business and federal only and created Presidio Government Solutions Limited, AKA Presidio Federal, a wholly owned subsidiary uh, reporting to a, uh, a board of directors and not uh, as a business unit of uh, direct business units of Presidio. Uh, so you can see on this slide, uh, we are now uh, a wholly owned subsidiary operating out of Reston, Virginia. We're a comparatively small company of about 75 plus employees uh, with all of the uh, partner and uh, uh, partner internal processes, plus uh, most of the resources aimed at uh, you in the government space. Okay, so I'm gonna move forward another slide. Okay, there we go. So again, you know, this spinoff, Presidio Federal, is dedicated to understanding the U.S. federal mission. This is the only thing we do. You know, our customer-facing engineers and sales teams have an average of 25 years plus experience in the federal marketplace. And I'm sure that you'll find, if you look at some of the, some of the uh, industry counterparts that you may have worked with, uh, that that is quite a differentiator in the marketplace. Uh, we certainly uh, have invested appropriately uh, that we have a very engineering uh, focused organization. Uh, we fancy ourselves to be a value added integrator instead of a traditional value added reseller or fulfillment shop. Uh, you know, some of our key clients are outlined on the slide on the right in the blue box. Uh, if you are part of these agencies, uh, we are already likely engaged. We can uh, there and we can provide references uh, to, to help to instill confidence that you have in us and to, uh, you know, to move forward. If you're part of another agency and you're outside the focus there, you know, please uh, reply to any uh, post event outreach that we, we provide or to Kerasoft and or to the AWS and, uh, and Wicker folks and uh, we can be part of the conversation. Uh, I'm sure that you will appreciate our no pressure consultative approach, especially uh, after being in the marketplace and seeing how other folks work. All right, so to sum it up, and we do wanna you know, keep, move forward to the questions and answers, which I hope that most of you are staying on board for. Uh, you know, here's how to, how, to, how to find us. Uh, we have our own website that's distinct from Presidio Corporation at presidiofederal.com. You can follow us on these social medias uh, and or uh, reach back to the carousel folks and ask how to get a hold of us. Uh, so with that, uh, again, I wanna thank everybody for their participation today and interest. Uh, we hope you have the opportunity to, uh, to support you in the agencies. And I wanna pass this over to the moderator for the Q&A portion. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Paul. We'll go ahead and give it a few minutes for any questions to pop in. Feel free to use the chat pod or the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen. We're going to call on people if they're not volunteering questions. <laughs> <laughs> you get extra credit for the for asking questions for your uh, your your training credits, guys. It looks like we do have one. This is a question based for Wicker. Out of out on band communications was a key call out in the EO. There are lots of apps for this space. Can you elaborate a little on why Wicker is different in regards to this? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, it, it's a couple things. Uh, one is the end to end encryption, which I highlighted earlier, um, being at the core of you know, every packet of information that goes across the Wicker network. And then the second piece is the compliance and administrative control. So again, what we find, you know, when, when customers, uh, either public or private sector customers are talking to us that they want to make sure that they still have the ability to do the logging as Mike highlighted to, 
manage the environment uh, on, on uh, you know, sort of meeting their standards and requirements, and then also have the ability to sort of, uh, uh, you know, determine, you know, what the policies and, and practices are for their specific uh, communication and collaborations uh, needs. So I think, you know, there's, as I said earlier, there's lots of ways to do this and lots of uh, tools that give you that ability. But I think the differentiator for Wicker is really around the coupling of the encryption and everything that we do and the ability to have full administrative control of your environment. So, but a really good, really good question. Looks like we have a couple more. Someone asked, what are the challenges in security during software versions? If I'm reading this correctly. Yeah, I don't really understand the question. I mean, I, I, I'll give you my perspective on software development, right? Um, software, software, software developed incorrectly obviously can affect a lot of different people, systems, critical systems, non-critical systems, um, you know, critical infrastructure systems, stuff like that. So the care in developing software um, as, as exposed by, again, the SolarWinds incident, keeping defects out, which is a pretty known uh, and well-established process in the software development world, but also extending that to keeping malicious activity out of that, whether it comes from an internal um, an actor or an external actor. So the goals really here are to be able to identify the components that make up the software, the package of software, the, 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 uh, the application, um, so that you can quickly go back and address vulnerabilities based upon that software bill of material. But it's also the ability to be able to ensure that the only thing that goes into your uh, packages for your software development are things that are vetted by your organization. So that means that there's a careful analysis of all the different, you know, when you think about things like um, uh, source libraries and, and source repositories, right? making sure that those things have the same security parameters, multi-factor authentication, conditional access, and that you go through the vetting process whenever a new version of um, uh, a piece of software, whether it's a module or, or a simple hot fix or something like that, when they get uploaded, they go through the vetting process. So there's a, there's a lot of different ways you can consider software development and the security around that. I just, uh, it's kind of a broad answer. I didn't really understand the question in its specificity. Thank you, Mike. It looks like we have another question. What are the key differences between Wicker compared to Adobe Connect? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm gonna be transparent and say, I don't have a full answer because uh, Adobe Connect tends not to be one of the platforms we run into most frequently. Um, I have used it a couple of times, so so I am familiar with it. But uh, what I'd love to do, Erwin, is get your contact information, or I can share my contact information, and then get you connected to one of our engineers uh, that might be a little bit more familiar with Connect um, than I am, um, because I, I just don't want to I just don't want to give you incorrect information. I guess what I would say at a high level is, you know, again from a collaboration perspective, you know from using connect you know a lot of this you know a lot of the collab elements you know voice video chat things like that seem to be consistent you know i think again uh where the differentiation would likely come would be around the encryption that we provide but again i'd like to take a deeper look at that before i uh answer too much further so um happy to put my uh contact info in the chat or, you know, connect to me via the uh, Kerasoft team and I'll get you connected to one of my engineers who can fill in some of the puzzle pieces that I haven't answered here, so. Thank you. It looks like something else came up in the chat. To summarize in very few words, what are the three keys to fulfill new cybersecurity mandates? Yeah, hi, this is Mike again. So I, I actually saw that. Um, pop up on the screen. So that's a difficult one. Uh, the challenge really is few words and three things. I would say, I would say compliance, right? Um, the compliance regimes are there for a reason. They constantly evolve. So you're obviously having to have a, a life cycle management 
what we call drift management or life cycle management of your configurations, right? Um, it's observability. And I would, I would venture to guess, there's a couple of other ones I can think of, but I would venture to guess is recoverability, right? So an incident, uh, a cybersecurity incident uh, playbook, right? Sort of like a disaster recovery playbook. How do I go from, you know, an event? So things like, hey, I want to protect my data so that my data is never compromised, right? But how do I go from an event and down or a debt and compromise to back up and running, not compromise anymore. So I would say compliance, but it's an ever evolving thing. I would say observability, right? It's always nice. Think about the car. Some cars have more idiot lights than others. I got a car that's got sensors on everything. So the more sensors you have, the more where you are, tire pressure, temperature and the transmission, the differential, the engine, all that stuff, right? So observability is really key, compliance, observability, and then configuration management, right? So configuration management is super critical. Configuration management is, isn't just configuring and managing, it's configuring the, the correct way and making sure you don't drift away from that. So a lot of times in the, in, in the industry, you'll get a FISMA package and a FISMA ATO for an application. CDM is one of those things that helps you manage the drift of that application away from its compliance baseline. So compliance, configuration management, and observability. Thank you, Mike. It looks like we have another one. This one says, it feels like users have to make a choice between security and privacy concerns and feature function benefits. Can you talk a little bit about how Wicker approaches this? Yeah, I mean, again, I, you know, uh, I'm going to touch on a little bit of what I said earlier and just expand on it. Uh, you know, I think our approach and our philosophy is that we can do both um, because, again, uh, you know, we're very mindful of, you know, user experience and, and user functionality. And we do a lot of beta testing and, and uh, you know, internal analysis of, you know, how everything's working and how everything fits together and what the user experience is. But uh, encryption is always going to be at the core of what we do. So anytime we add a feature, we're only going to add that feature if it meets all of the uh, requirements uh, and, and is consistent with what the platform is already providing from a security perspective. So again, as I, I think I used the phrase earlier, best of both worlds, that's sort of our, you know, one of our hallmark philosophies that, you know, we want to make sure that you have all the capabilities that you need to be able to communicate and collaborate with your coworkers or, or clients or constituents or anybody in between, but do so in a manner that, you know, has that security and compliance uh, theme as, a, as the underpinning, so. Thank you. And then I have one more screen to share. I'd like to thank all of our participants for joining us, as well as all of our speakers for presenting and answering our questions today. We hope this webcast has been helpful for you and your organization. Again, this webcast was recorded and a copy of the presentation will be emailed to you shortly. If you have any further questions or would like to request more information, feel free to contact the VMware team at Kerasoft. Our contact information is displayed, so please don't hesitate to call or email us. Thank you everyone for your time and have a great day.